Hi guys, it's Holly here and welcome to the Strong Women podcast. The aim of this podcast is to interview strong women from all walks of life and take key learnings from their personal experiences. Now by saying strong, I don't exclusively mean strong physically. I'll be talking to women who are strong mentally, emotionally or simply women who have overcome odds throughout their lives. The key themes in each episode will be around fitness, mental health, and business. I truly hope their stories inspire you and encourage you, and equally I hope you can take away valuable pieces of advice to practice in your own lives. Today's guest is Kimberly Wilson, a chartered psychologist and visiting lecturer working in private practice in central London. Kimberly is the current governor of the Tavistock and Portman NHS Mental Health Trust and the former chair of the British Psychological Society's Training Committee in Counselling Psychology, the group responsible for monitoring and assessing the standards of counselling psychology training across the UK. She also formerly led the therapy service at HMP and YOI Holloway, Europe's largest women's prison. As a former finalist on the Great British Bake Off, she's also an occasional TV presenter, food writer, contributor to radio, print and online media on food, psychology and the interaction of the two. What I love about Kimberly is she's taken her two passions, food and psychology, and created a successful and fulfilling career from both. In this podcast, we discuss her impressive career path, the role of social media in mental health, and the lack of inclusion and diversity in the wellness industry. I hope you enjoy it, and please do leave us a review if you get chance. If any of the topics in this podcast resonate with you or someone you know, please do share the podcast on your social channels to help us spread the amazing positive advice this strong woman shares. Hi, Kimberly. How are you? I'm very, very good. Hello. Good. Uh, thank you so much for being on the podcast. Pleasure. Thank you for having How me. does it feel being on this side? Because you've got your <laughs> own podcast, haven't you? It's, it's all right so far. Um, so far. <laughs> I am much happier asking the questions, but that's yeah. fine. You've got to know what it's like on the other side. Pressure's on you today. Um, so we're going to start with a quick fire round. So just come up with the first answer that comes into your head. Right. And so your favourite book and why? Um, there are two. Am I allowed to have two? You can have two. Okay. Um, Man's Search for Meaning by a psychotherapist called um, Frankel, uh, Victor Frankel. Mm-hmm. And he, I've posted it a couple of times on my Instagram. He was a Jewish psychiatrist and he um, survived the Nazi concentration camps. And it was his observation that the people who seemed to survive, so the, the obviously the conditions were atrocious and everyone was starving and everybody was struggling, but what he noticed was, the, was that the people who had the most resilience or the people who seemed to be able to last longer were those who had defined for themselves a meaning to keep going. Um, and it didn't have to be anything big. It didn't have to be a, a grand task. One man was just, he was writing his own little series of books and he wanted to continue that. Um, another man had promised that he was going to see his daughter and and it was just these little things that help us to find a reason for living and I think it's so important I think we get really lost and and taken away from our idea that our lives have purpose and they have meaning and that either you find it or you look for it but to have a sense of meaning in your life is so central to well-being Mm. Um, so that's a book that I regularly reread and recommend to other people and my other one is the picture of dorian gray just because oscar wilde is just the most exquisite writer and he's funny and he's smart and he comes up with just turns a phrase that you would never never ever imagine and i just think it's just uh it's it's like a lesson and a, a step into a completely different world and I, I just love it two very different books i guess that must be like your reading shelf you know you've got the ones for work and then the ones for you yeah, I'm quite eclectic, I think, in in lots of different ways. And I think that's it's part of, of just being curious and I think also part of trying to keep my mind open because I think, it's again, it's very easy to get narrow and only look at the things that you know you like or that you would think will agree with the way that you see the world. And I think it's really important in order not just to do a good job but to be a decent human being is to try to keep as broad a sense of 
the world and perspectives as possible so I do try to kind of look around quite broadly yeah Yeah, and you can so easily get that from books um the best piece of advice you've ever been given oh people don't tend to give me advice (laughs) you're typically giving them advice Um, (laughs) oh I'm not sure hold on let me think or it could be the piece of advice you find yourself giving other people frequently um one of the things that I think people need to maybe think critically. I think don't believe everything you think is probably a good one. Mm -hmm. Um, And again, that's the idea that you can end up in a little a rabbit hole where you're so convinced that an idea that you have come up with is true, that it can lead you astray. And actually what you need is a little bit of take a pause and have a think, think critically. And just because you've thought it doesn't make it true. Mm. Um, and, and it's always worth keeping in mind that you might be wrong, whether it's about an opinion about yourself or about someone else. It's just, you know, keep open the door to the possibility that you're wrong. I really like that. It's so true because you, you know, every day you might make assumptions on how someone's behaved around you. One of the things that we might see quite often is clients that come here who um, are very quiet at first Mm -hmm. and you think, well, maybe it's just they don't want to chat or they're very standoffish and actually it can just be they're really nervous. nervous. And you can go away and think, oh, maybe they didn't enjoy their session. Maybe it's me. And actually it's something just so, it's not even about you. It's not about you. No. You have no idea what it could be. Um, that's probably another one like don't assume you can even guess what's going on for someone else Everything, everyone's got something going on in their life Absolutely. Um, what is your morning routine um, so I I'm quite fortunate in that I can manage my time so I don't have an alarm clock <gasps> that's the dream <laughs> my alarm clock is 4.30 oh, oh my god what, I'm a kid wow that. good um, for you that's yeah, amazing that's yeah, really nice um, and so I kind of get up, I try to do a workout early-ish. I'm a bit of a falafela. <laughs> I kind of faff around quite a lot to try to get out and do a workout first thing because then most of my day is sedentary, so I try to kind of get the movement in early on. Um, and I should probably go online a little bit too early, um, check any messages and stuff that have come in check any responses that I might get from from Twitter and Instagram but then kind of get myself into work work out come home shower go into work and get ready for for clinic perfect so it's always similar or a creature of habit or um I'm am I I'm not really I'm quite am I hmm um well it changes because I I do a lot of different things Mm. I guess um so on clinic days, that's I guess that's my routine. On other days, the morning stays fairly the same, and then the afternoons is more writing and researching and reading. Um, but yeah, flexible. broadly, yeah, flexible with a, a hint of routine. Yeah. Um, what does happiness look like to you? Um, I think happiness is contentment. I think we have this slightly disordered idea that happiness is this intense experience of constant joy (laughs) where we're leaping about and everything is fantastic um (laughs) and while those moments are wonderful and important I think happiness is a much more grounded experience of a sense of contentment a sense of uh resilience that I can manage it's it's gonna be okay um that I have the resources either within me or around me or I can ask for them um to manage what's coming for me and so it's I guess in that sense is a state of not being anxious um because I think otherwise it's so easy to be in a constant sense a constant state of anxiety about what's coming, what you have to do, who you need to impress, whose approval you need. And and so I think happiness forward slash contentment is that sense that you've got what you need or that you have the capacity to create it for yourself. I like the idea of contentment because otherwise it does feel like happiness is something you're forever chasing. 
you know, a quote we hear quite a lot is, I will be happy if I lose a stone or I will be happy if I fit into the clothes. But what I does that even mean? That's not even happiness. That's, that's a sense of kind of um, feeling gratified, mm. isn't it? It's, it's more like I will feel as if I have achieved, achieved. someone else's approval. Yeah. That's not happiness. That's this kind of much more fleeting sense of having imagine that you fit somebody else's imagined criteria for you and if you're always doing that then you're absolutely never, never going to be content happy. with with where you are yeah so true and then the last one what does strong look like to you um strong for me is i guess it is resilience i've said it a couple of times but i guess it is um a sense of low-level optimism. <laughs> so it doesn't have to be ecstatic. You don't have to be like Pollyanna. Everything's fantastic. <laughs> Sunshine flowers, bubble gum rain. Like you don't have to be like that. But just a sense that okay, this crappy or awful thing has happened. All right, it's not good right now. But here we are. What do we do now? And I think if you can you can create or try to develop that kind of attitude, then, then you can't help but succeed because it means you're never defeated. So, yeah, I think that's strong. For me. I really like that. Um, okay, then, Kimberly, in your right. own words, who are you and what do you do? All right. So in my own words, I have too many job titles <laughs> <laughs> I so the first thing is that I am a psychologist and that is the thing that I have trained longest doing this is the thing that I love it's the thing that I care most about it's the thing that I think everybody needs more of um a more understanding of um in terms of my clinical experience I have one set of expertise working forensically. Um, I worked in a prison for about six or seven years and I ran a therapy service there. Um, and so have a lot of experience working in prisons and with personality disorders, which I really, really enjoy. Um, and I think there needs to be much more awareness around working with personality disorders and what it's like for people with, in particular, borderline personality disorder. Um, because I think it's really misunderstood both... Um, by lay people and can be quite difficult for professionals to work with sometimes. Um, so that's one thing. Uh, the other thing is uh, an interest or specialism really in food and eating behaviours. So I apply something in my practice called nutritional psychiatry, which is looking at the role of food and nutrients on the structure and function of the brain and how we can use food and nutrients to prevent or help recover from mental illness, um, as well as looking at uh, our relationships with food, what food says about us as a society um, on a personal level. So really anything in the overlap between food and psychology is where I kind of make my little house. So you're basically taking two passions and, and merge them together. Yeah. And made a really sustainable career out of it as well. Hopefully. <laughs> So where did it all start then? So how, did you did you know you wanted to go straight into psychology from school? Or? I am one of those odd, rare, not necessarily to be admired people that knew exactly what they wanted to do um, at the age of 16. I knew from then that I wanted to be a psychologist. Um, and so I just, I've been on a very straight road into that. So psychology A-levels, psychology undergrad, I've got two master's degrees um, and have just focused kind of clinically on that. I started very, very early for that reason. So psychology or therapy tends to be a second career. Most people do something first for 10 or 15 years, then often stop to have a family and then come back into psychology. Um, but so when I was doing my, my professional training, I was, I think, the youngest person in, in my cohort. So um, I've been practicing for a a fair while despite being fairly young for for my profession um 
and it's really and I've in that time I've also taken on some professional roles so I have been the chair of the training committee at the British Psychological Society um, I'm currently a governor at the uh, Tavistock and Portman NHS which is a specialist mental health trust um, so I'm also really interested in provision and um, good quality and like quality assurance as well so um, I've managed to get involved in a few things you've done so time. much like when I was researching all of you you know your background I just kept seeing all these roles and I was thinking how on earth have you managed to squeeze all that in um working several jobs at the same time yeah tends to be the thing um which is again I think it's partly the, the curiosity I'm, I'm quite interested in things I'll, I'll try I'll give them a go and and see if it fits I'll stick with it if it doesn't well I've tried it and I've you know I found out something either about myself or about the organisation or about somebody else. It's all, I think, everything, all experiences about data gathering and working out what's useful for you. And how do you look after yourself then? Because you do you, you must work long hours or at least spin a lot of plates. Um, yes, but I think partly... Um, so I think I'm a bit of an ambivert. So that's never heard that word. So there's extroversion, introversion, and ambies are somewhere in the middle, or yeah. you can kind of switch. And probably most people are a bit of a blend. Um, but the extrovert part of me needs a lot of stimulation um, and and quite enjoys it. I have quite a, sh- a small threshold for boredom. Um, I don't like sitting around very long. I can't watch really unless they're very very good I can't watch long movies after about 90 minutes I'm like (laughs) yeah (laughs) time to get on so I'm I'm always reading or researching something and it sparks a thought so then I have to write something or post something do a podcast and so in one sense that is spinning a lot of plates but in another sense that I, I think of them as creative outlets and I think creative outlets are crucial for mental health um I think people don't pay enough attention to them and they don't have enough of them um that so much of life is focused around the job and the kind of mechanics of the job that people forget that you're not just a robot doing Mm. a job and that you're a human with creative needs um but equally I also I am very good at not doing stuff um I don't feel pressure to constantly be doing things or being seen to do things I'm not Um, I'm busy in the sense that I have lots of things to do. I'm not busy in the sense that I'm running around chasing my tail all the time um, or trying to prove how, I don't know, how occupied and busy Mm. I am and, you know, how important I am. Like, it's it's none of that. If I need to spend an hour lying down doing very little, then I'm very happy to do that without feeling guilty at all. (laughs) And that's so hard to do, isn't it? But I guess you're in a position where you know the dangers of being that person, that type A person who is always running around, nothing's ever good enough. Um, So you're in the best position to look after your mental health. Would you say that's the same for all people that work in mental health? Or Yes and no. So one of the things about my job is that I do think it's, it's given me this really precious and unusual perspective on on life so for example you know I haven't hit middle age yet but I know for sure that the midlife crisis is a real thing it's a real thing everybody (laughs) and it's the thing that occurs when you realize that you haven't been living true to your values so you get to a certain point you've been following the, the rules, you know, you've got a good job and you've been earning the money and you've maybe settled down into a stable relationship, whether it's a relationship you always wanted or a relationship with the person you should be with, whether it's a job you even like or feel that you um, have the opportunity to have autonomy or, again, a kind of creative outlook in it or whether it's just, you know, a good job that looks good on the CV and to everybody else. Um, the midlife crisis is, is when you get to that point where you're facing your mortality frankly (laughs) take it (laughs) we've we've gone there all right so you know you get to your kind of existential crisis like Mm. maybe your parents are older and you're suddenly realizing that you're getting older as well and you look back and you think have I lived the life that I wanted to live have I lived a life that is really true to me or have I lived a life that has been about satisfying somebody else 
And I feel incredibly privileged that by virtue of, of the work that I do, that I got that understanding very, very early. And it gave me the opportunity to make choices in my life that were about, to use a really overused word, <laughs> authenticity. Um, but really, you know, not necessarily chasing money, excuse me, um, not trying to mould myself to fit what I think other people would approve of, you know, not trying to be cool. I know, I know I'm not a cool person. I'm, I'm very nerdy. <laughs> like I have, <laughs> and, but, but being okay with not yeah. being cool. Do you know what I mean? Like, okay, it's fine. It's fine. Um, you find your tribe, you find your tribe of equally odd people and you settle in and, and to be okay with that. And I think that has, given me a kind of sense of assurance I realized that I can't remember the original question <laughs> oh it was um I don't even know now we went off on a little a little tangent we did go, oh it was um saying about how people in mental health do you feel like they have a better understanding um, of how to look after themselves because actually For example, in fitness, the busier you are, the less fitness you actually get to do. And some of the most unhealthy people I know actually work in fitness. So I've always wondered whether as a psychologist... Oh, that's where I was going. You're really, yeah, aware. Yes, because the other thing is, so yes, and so um, it's also made me choose to work, for example, not in a in the NHS because I think there's an awful amount of burnout and pressure in the NHS. And it's it's very sad because I would much actually rather be working in the NHS because I believe in the NHS but I think the conditions in the NHS for psychology and for mental health provision is is far from ideal Um, and it means that people are working with really excessive caseload so you can't give each person the kind of care you would want to be giving them Um, it means that often often the the surroundings aren't ideal they they might not be consistent you might have a different room every time yeah you you know chasing people you know it's it's not conducive certainly to the way that I trained which is to be able to give people really good quality thinking space and attention um and I think actually ironically there's a huge amount of of stress depression burnout in mental health professionals Mm -hmm. because aside from the conditions, we're also people who we get into these jobs because we care. Mm. You know, it's, we're not, we know it's not going to be kind of the jet stream of high paying work. You get in because either you've seen it work for other people or you care about it, you've seen it work for yourself and you want to do it. And that means, as has happened to me in the past when I did work in the NHS, that you end up being, again, kind of giving and giving and giving and not necessarily being able to take time for yourself because you feel like other people will be missing out or you'll be taking something away from clients who are in such need. It's a really, really, really tough balance to draw. But then also, unfortunately, I've had the experience and I've heard people tell me that that gets exploited when you're in a caring profession that gets exploited. And people, I've had um, other therapists tell me that they've had managers say, well, well, if you really cared about them, you'd work for free. Oh, that's awful. And, and that's such a denigration of how of the work and and how hard it is mm-hmm. and how much effort it takes and how much of a toll it takes on you, you know, all of that stuff. So it's I feel like I've had to make certain decisions like working independently, which are about ensuring that I can take care of myself in order to take the very best care that I can of the people who come to see me and work with me. Hi guys, sorry to interrupt this podcast. I wanted to mention that if you're enjoying this episode, I would really appreciate a review of it once you finish listening. You can do this on my website, on SoundCloud, or on iTunes. Furthermore, why not share it with all your friends and your family on social media and let's spread the strong, not skinny ethos as far and wide as possible. Now back to the podcast. I hope you enjoy the rest of this episode. Hi 
that's such a shame, isn't mm. it? Because, yeah, you want to help people. I think it's the same with teachers as well. Quite Absolutely. a lot of our friends are teachers. Um, you know, and the ones that really care and are really good and diligent have so much work to do that they then have no social life mm. um, and they burn out and we lose all of these amazing teachers. Yeah. Um, such a shame. So then I guess... One question is, what does your week look like then? What does the week in the life of Kimberly look like? Um, it's very, very varied. So I um, have my clinic uh, for the first half of the week. And then I do my... So I have a podcast. So I'm either interviewing people or editing, um, writing introductions and things like that. Um, I also... I do... The podcast is split over interviews and also kind of short essays, so of things that I just find interesting. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, for example, I'm thinking of doing a, a short wellness series now, um, looking at some of the other aspects of wellness. So, diversity in wellness is one of them. The other is um, my theory about the way that the new boom in wellness is is filling a gap in people's lives for for meaning and purpose um so that's a little theory I'm working on I'm so I'm doing a little research for that um I have a a seminar like workshop coming up in November which is helping people it's open to the public um helping people to understand the lifestyle factors that can help build resilience so all the evidence-based information about how and how and what types of nutrition exercise sleep breathing, stress management can help them build resilience um, to things like depression and anxiety and dementia. Um, so I do that. I write quite a few articles for people. Um, so it's it's really varied um, at the moment. Mm. Mm. Sort of, <laughs> have you read the book, that, um, is it Multi-Hyphen Method or The Multi-Hyphenate by Emma Gannon? I haven't, but Gannon? I've had someone... Like refer to me like that. Yeah, I was literally just thinking like <laughs> this is what she is. <laughs> um, and you're really passionate, aren't you, about making sure that everything is evidence based. Mm, yeah. And and also, I know off off not off camera, off of podcast. <laughs> uh, we were talking about whether you consider yourself as being part of the wellness industry mm. or not. So tell, where's this come from? Um, so yeah, so for example, um, yesterday I was approached to do a, a round table discussion about, um, body positivity and, um, and the obesity epidemic. So I think certainly I am viewed as being part of wellness and I guess I, I feel like I sit on the edge of wellness, giving it a bit of side eye because, <laughs> Um, I think up, up until very recently, I was very much just a psychologist working quietly in my room with my clients. And, and then what happened was, and, and the, the thing about being a therapist is that the emphasis really is on, is on anonym, anonymity. It's really about giving away as little as possible about me and mm. my personal life, my likes, my beliefs, my interests. Um, because that can interfere with the clinical work. Um, and so it's, it was quite a gamble, really, to do a more public-facing work. But I felt it was important, um, and I made the decision after people were coming to me and saying things like, oh, well, I, I can't eat that, you know, and I work with people with eating disorders um, and other eating issues, so people who secret eaters or binge eaters or people who have a tendency to steal food and I don't know why that sort of thing um and so they will come to me with all these strange and I have a postgrad in nutrition so that I knew that some of these ideas about nutrition were inaccurate and, and <laughs> false um but I would end up spending so much time fact checking and debunking nutritional information that it meant so much of the therapy time was was lost. And so I felt like I needed to be aware of what, in particular, the young women who were coming to see me were reading and viewing and taking in and starting to implement in their lives that was leading or contributing to their eating problems that then led them to come and see me. And then, and so I started kind of going online and reading and finding out astonishing things like, 
that 90, I think it's 90, somewhere 95 percent of young people, when they're looking for health advice, will turn to social media, which is astonishing considering anyone and their dog can have an Instagram account yeah. <laughs> and can be saying anything they like based on absolutely nothing. But knowing that so many of my young clients were going onto social media and reading wellness blogs and taking the information that they found there for absolute gospel truth um, was really worrying. And so that's when I decided to be a bit more vocal about things that I knew were absolute nonsense, like detox diets and things like that. Um, and that's when I started to kind of get hooked up with other people doing similar stuff, like Laura Thomas and Pixie Turner and Megan Rossi, all out there doing evidence-based stuff and I put obviously a psychological stint on mine and that's why I did the conference earlier in the year which was um it was called wellness what's the evidence which was about providing people with a place having the audience come in and say look just ask questions here are qualified nutritionists here are dietitians here are people who are working within the wellness industry just ask them directly and find you know finally get a, a reasoned evidence-based answer so um yeah I don't know if is if therapy would be considered part of wellness um I guess in a sense it should or could um but I kind of sit on the fringe because I I keep an eye on wellness I think I think it's difficult isn't it because if we actually think about the word wellness it's trying to be as well as possible and that can keep expanding and expanding and you know it might have started with nutrition and fitness and now we you know we also have meditation and and yeah I guess you know therapy and it's it sleep it's only yeah. going to grow but the sad thing is, it is an industry that is absolutely booming and it, it, it's working out how to have a business within that, yeah, that sits well with you. And and I guess that's the real difficulty for people like yourself where, you know, you deserve to have a personal life and, and social media, unfortunately, is an insight into people's personal mm. lives as well, whilst also making sure that it is being responsible mm. for the potential people following you. And, you know, I, I've always been very open about the fact I do see a lot of accounts on social media where I just, I cannot believe the types of photos they're putting up, knowing the type of followers that they have following them. Um, you know, it, whether it's in nutrition, mm -hmm. uh, that's quite a common one, which mm. I find very sad. And I, I think there does have to be an element of, of responsibility as to mm. what you're posting. There really is. And, and I, I was on a panel at uh, Lululemon, they have a Sweat Life Festival. Um, and I was on a panel with um, the editor of Women's Health. And, uh, you know, there was lots of kind of stuff going on about, uh, about that, about how much responsibility do uh, content creators have for the content that they put out. And one of the arguments and one of the questions came up from the audience saying, well, actually, people need to be more savvy consumers and they should just you know they should double check their the authority of the people that they follow but actually that's <sighs> disagree a hundred percent like how can you how can you sleep at night and you know I've always been very vocal about my opinion of women's health in that it, it's like a 50 50 approach with them 50 percent of the time they're saying here are the top five foods that are going to help you lose weight really quickly and then you know the other the other 50 percent of the time they're talking about you know how to feel better in your body mm. and I do I think you can't you can't be both you you can you should be one or the other you know take the holistic approach or take the aesthetic approach I don't think you can be both I don't think it's fair to say that the readers you know or it's all about you know they want mm. the, the thing that people say to me all the time the press when I say I'm sorry, I'm not writing about weight loss, but I can write to you about, I can write about how glutes work or what happens if you've got lordosis and they say women don't want to read about that. Mm. And I, I've banged my head against all so many times. I just think you're, you're completely wrong. It's just, you're not providing them with those kind of articles. And so you're feeding mm. like this interesting constant weight loss when actually we should be providing them with something that's a bit more educational. Oh, it just doesn't. Like, yeah, it gets more, me so angry. More satisfying. Yeah, and I, I and and I think what it does is to un, is to overestimate how much trust people put in in people. Mm. Like, first of all, the effect of the number of followers is really significant, and it's you know it's the halo effect. It's a psychological effect where if, if you've already attributed 
one positive quality to somebody else, you're going to, to somebody, you're, you're going to extend other positive qualities to them. So if you look at someone and think, hmm, they're attractive, you're more likely to believe the information that they tell you. That's, we know that that's what happens. And then if that person then garners a lot of followers, then that gives them credibility because everyone, you know, you have this kind of group think experience where you go, well, everybody else seems to agree that they're a sensible person. They must be a sensible person. Mm. And what it also misses that the, the approach that it's the onus is on the audience. And I do think there is a really important part in which people need to be much more critical in their appraisal of, of these things. But it misses the fact that a lot of the time it's a, these are really young people, that they are early teenagers who are looking at these websites, these blogs, these magazines, and haven't actually developed the critical thinking skills in order to be able mm. to make those judgments about the quality of the information that's coming out. So I think you've got to be, you have to, you, you just have to be respectful of that just be respectful and I'm not saying people can't talk about things that have worked for them but make it explicit that it's it's worked for you yeah you know that is you can't be sure that it's not going to work for anybody for everybody else you can't be sure yeah that this is just it's an anecdote you don't know the evidence behind it you don't know the mechanism behind it you recommend that people either read the information themselves or go and ask an expert. Like, just be clear and explicit when it's an anecdote or an opinion versus when it's a piece of, of good quality evidence. Yeah. Um, and one of the things that I do with anything that I put out is to put the reference at the bottom of my Instagram post. And that's because I'm saying, look, I'm not asking you to just take my word for it. This isn't an ego trip where I just want you to go, well done, you're so clever, well done. <laughs> like I, don't, I care about the information and I want people to have good quality information. And for that reason, I give you a direct link to the information. Go and read it for yourself. Get someone else to read it. Ask another expert to, to appraise whether it's a decent piece of research and then make a decision for yourself. Mm. I'm just putting it out there and, I, I'm, and I'm giving you my opinion on how I've evaluated it. Um, but it's absolutely not about me trying to say I am the final position of this piece of information and you have to do what I say. Yeah. So I think a little bit of responsibility and a bit of humility from content creators is, is really essential to try to ensure that wellness, as it grows, and it will grow, I'm sure, is as safe for the people coming into it as it possibly can be. Yeah, and that it's legitimate. You're not making massive claims. Yeah. Um, and so then are you seeing are you seeing a negative effect as the wellness industry grows in clinic? Mm. Are you seeing any link? So I obviously I have a very skewed sample. Yeah. <laughs> like so the I bias see effect, yeah, it? like <laughs> the very very pointy end, but I think that's it's still a valid position um, to bring to the to the fore because I think what people don't see when they see hundreds of thousands of followers or you know lots of likes or lots of comments appreciative comments under under a post are the people who are so anxious that they can they can barely eat or the people that have spent you know two hours that morning doing Tabata class followed by a spin class followed by a lifting session because they think they need to beast themselves in order to be healthy and actually what they've done is absolutely exhaust their bodies and they've thrown their stress hormones sky mm. high they can't sleep all of this stuff what they're not seeing is that because people take this information at face value they say well if it works for you it's I guess if you know what you're saying it's going to work for me and I'll just do that and if it doesn't work straight away I'll just work harder um and so what I want is for content creators to be aware that that is, even if it's a minority, a significant and important minority of their audience are people who trust and believe what they say. And, be, and content creators should assume that people are taking what they say at face value and therefore should structure their content to be nuanced and balanced enough that it, you know, at the very least doesn't do any harm. Um, and you know maybe put disclaimers and remind people that hey you know everybody's bodies are different genetics are different microbiomes are different experiences are different environments are different and all of those things play a part mm. you know like we said everyone's got something going on in their life we're all so very different mm. um, and I guess the thing 
And and I'm completely aware that I am part of this. I think the saddest thing is that actually if you take um, the fitness slash wellness influences, they all look very similar. Mm -hmm. It's very white (laughs) middle class. um, And I don't think that that's a coincidence. What, What do you think is behind that? I think underlying racism or underlying uh, idealistic, like you said earlier on, I guess people want to look at, trust somebody who they might find attractive and therefore are more likely to believe what they're saying Mm. and therefore it grows. I I don't know. Mm. I think it's really tricky. So this is one of the things I'm I'm kind of looking into at the moment. Um, And it's, one of the questions is what is wellness about, right? Um, because if wellness is, if we take the kind of literal translation, which is you know, promoting well-being and uh, reducing risk of disease, so it's just like being as healthy as you can be, um, then wellness as an industry should be reaching out to the people most at risk, right? So if we're talking about trying to promote health, we should be looking at the people who are most most at risk of poor health and we know that in the UK that actually black and minority ethnic black and Asian minority ethnic groups have a higher disease burden than than white people right so there's higher heart disease risk there's more diabetes disease risk there's more metabolic syndrome there are more likely to be um problems in in pregnancy um then a black man is 17 times more likely to be diagnosed with a severe mental disorder than a white man is. 17, 17 times. times. That's huge. Okay. And so if, if wellness is about looking at health, then how are we not reaching out to those groups? Um, and I think that's, that's just a question. Maybe it's a question that really needs some robust and respectful debate you know we need to have a serious question uh, discussion about this mm-hmm. um and the other thing is about representation and it's about well it, again where if and particularly in london so over the last couple of years i've attended wellness conferences and i've spoken at wellness conferences so balance like i said lululemon sweat life i've been to the health bloggers conference twice and overwhelmingly the, the the people in attendance are young, white, often blonde women. And I think that's extraordinary because, and this is all in London, because 40% of the London population is black, Asian or minority ethnic. So why are those people not there? You know, and that's a big question. That's about, do they, you know, do they not feel like they're welcome or are they self-selecting out? Or, you know, what what are the many factors, I'm sure, that mean that, that people of colour aren't coming to these events mm. or don't feel that they fit in these spaces. Yeah. Um, and, and representation matters. So when we're looking at influencers, representation really, really matters. And we know that because we know uh, the, um, the, the This Girl Can campaign. And the whole reason that that campaign came about was because the research said, look, women are put off exercising because they feel like their bodies don't fit the stereotype mm. and they're worried about looking red-faced and sweaty and, and and people looking at their bodies. And so the whole This Girl Can campaign came up and said, look, just exercise. Nobody gives a shit. You look amazing. We're not supposed to look, yeah. We're supposed to look <laughs> like, sexy. Get on and do the thing and have fun and it's about you yeah. and don't worry what you look like. And it's been enormously successful in getting young women in particular to get involved in sports. Um, and so we know that seeing that, just seeing that campaign, seeing those adverts makes a difference to how comfortable people feel entering exercise and health spaces. So we can extrapolate, I think, from that, that seeing more black and brown faces and bodies and bodies of different sizes mm-hmm. in these health spaces will make a difference to how comfortable people of colour feel in them. And yeah. I think that's that's a mantle that hasn't really been taken up very seriously by wellness. And yeah, I think there are some questions about why that is. It's so important. So a while ago, um, we put a post out asking anyone who 
doesn't necessarily exercise if what were the what was the barrier for them mm-hmm. so we said you know if there's any barrier that you find that stops you from going to that yoga class or you think I've always wanted to go and try rock climbing what's holding you back and a lot of people posted on the comment but the more interesting answers were actually the private messages mm-hmm. we got so many and yeah a lot of them were fear of not being fit enough mm-hmm. um or um it being too expensive but actually I thought the saddest thing was women messaging and saying I'm a woman of color and I just do not feel I, I never see a picture mm-hmm. of another woman of color exercising and I feel like I'm in no way included and I just thought that is the saddest thing um, to think that you can't go because on a much, 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 much smaller scale, I can see that, you know, women might, certain women might not want to go try playing football or boxing because they're seen as very masculine things to do. I cannot imagine not wanting to go and do something because of the color of my skin. And that's because I'm white and I, I, can't, I could never put myself in someone's shoes. I just, I just thought that that was something mm. I've never thought about and it was incredibly sad and it was a very common reply mm. to that post. Um, so that's where I then started realising, gosh, it is very one-sided. Um, what, I mean, do you have any advice on what, because, you know, I am white and I am blonde. <laughs> I'm not necessarily young anymore, um, but... You, there's no getting away from that, mm. but I, you know, I guess it would be interesting to know. I, I mean, I don't know what, how we can change it or make it's, women feel more included. It's speculative because like, these are kind of just my thoughts and observations, and I haven't kind of done a, a broad um, like survey of anything. Mm. But I think, and, and I guess this is where it gets a bit complicated or, or tricky because, on one hand, you also have to think about how competitive the wellness market is, right? And if you've already got a platform, then you work quite hard to maintain that platform. And I think it's only the very secure influencers who have started to open up their platform to other people and to invite them on or to, you know, to kind of platform other people. Because one of the things that I imagine would be very helpful is if you did that, is if if people said, okay, well, I'm going to ensure that I profile a you know, a black yoga instructor and find out about her or his classes um or I mean and that's also a slight tangent but that's another of the very interesting things about wellness is that so much of it borrows from black and Asian cultures I mean yoga is Indian yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> so where are all the Indian yoga instructors yeah. right um turmeric and sweet potatoes and all of these foods from black and asian cultures that are now so central to the wellness story which is then being promoted by white faces it's it, it's it's a it, a really interesting phenomenon and i think people really need to look at it quite seriously um because it's it's a very strange mix. There's a new thing called, I almost don't want to talk about it because I don't want to <laughs> kind of blow it up too much, but there's a, a thing called booty yoga. It's a new type of yoga. Um, and it it claims to have incorporated tribal elements. And then even the word tribal is a bit problematic, but again, it borrows from like traditional dance forms from Africa and the South Pacific and from India Mm. and and mixes them in with yoga and in inverted commas tribal music and you think and and again the the people who have developed it are are white Americans and uh, (laughs) it's a minefield it's a real minefield and and it's not because I can hear people going oh it's we should be able to share and we should be able to share look you know we're a global community and I'm not I'm not talking about kind of crude appropriation I'm talking about understanding though how this has happened and what's going on and why in a in a city where 40 percent of people are black are black and Asian a an initiative which is about health which should include everyone seems to be predominantly why you know what is going on there can we have a discussion about it can we talk about it without people freaking out and feeling like they're being attacked and feeling like they need to defend themselves like can we just have an open respectful curious discussion about 
what's going on here? How did this happen? Can we improve it? Can we help people feel more included? Um, and can we do it in a way which is respectful to everybody? And it's the same for any minority group as well, you know, Um, making sure that everyone feels included because at the end of the day, the whole purpose of exercise is just about getting your body moving. We all have a body. We can all use our body, even if you are wheelchair bound, you know, there's always Mm -hmm. options and it shouldn't be that it is seen that only a white, blonde, young person is the picture of health when actually Mm. you can't always see health in somebody there is no picture of health it is a very broad spectrum um so yeah i think that i think that's gosh it's such a big topic (laughs) isn't it but we do need to talk about it because we haven't talked about it for so long and look where we're at now and and that is such a shame that women are not coming to classes Mm. because they feel like they're not allowed yeah um Gosh. <laughs> um, so I guess I would love to finish then on what the best um, bit of your job is. Um, That's not very good grammar, is it? <laughs> what the best bit of your job is? is it? Um, what the most enjoyable part of your job is? Um, I, it's, it's, it's very much a cliche, but it's a cliche because it's true. I feel enormously, enormously privileged to do the job that I do. Um, to to be in a position where someone is trusting you, possibly for the first time ever in their lives, with the most fragile and tender personal aspects of themselves, their thoughts, their beliefs, their experiences, and opening themselves up to you for help is the most extraordinary privilege. And it's one that I take very, very seriously. Um, And I'm so grateful and I'm so in awe, actually, of the people who go to therapy. I'm going to get very moved here Um, because it's, I think it's the hardest work you can do. We're all really good at hiding from ourselves, lying to ourselves, denying things, pushing things away, you know, covering it up with any other type of coping mechanism. That I think the hardest thing you can do is to sit in a room with a stranger and say, this is who I am and this is what I'm about and these are the parts of my myself that scare me or that I don't understand, that confuse me. These are the ways in which I hurt myself or hurt other people or have been hurt. I think it's the most extraordinary thing. And the and people who go to therapy are some of the most courageous people I've ever, ever met. Um, and I think it's just in, incredibly privileging that um, I can be part of their lives in this way so wow and when you talk about it you can see it, it all over you that that you genuinely do feel so proud to be able to do that if anyone is listening who feels like they that they do have something that they need to talk to um, a professional about or they they know that they're avoiding something mm. what would be your advice I think Uh, awareness is always the very first step to change so just knowing and we all have a little niggle like we all have a little thing where we're like hmm maybe there's something going on something's just not right and that's that's your intuition and you should listen to it um I think I mean there are lots of things you can do obviously try to talk to someone someone you can trust if you can speak to a GP and try to get referral therapy that's important um but another thing that I think everybody should be doing and is massively underutilized is writing so keeping a journal and and specifically a handwritten journal because writing is a form of emotional processing when you have to write something out by hand you have to think about it and so in the process of thinking about it you do a small amount of emotional processing and it can be a really useful starting point for people who perhaps are very used to bottling things up or feel that talking about their feelings is a sign of weakness which is absolutely nonsense of course it's not it's a sign of strength um 
but it can be a really good starting point. Just, you know, starting with a question like, what am I feeling? Where am I feeling it? What's going on? And getting familiar with your own internal world. Because we're all really good at you know, focusing on the outside world and focusing on what's happening and focusing on other people's problems because that's a really good defense against mm. your own stuff. But taking a moment to think about yourself in your own internal world, writing it down and starting to get curious about your own minds. Like I think that's one of the biggest things I want people, I would love people to be doing is to be more curious about their own minds. Why do I think that? Not just what do I think, but why do I think that? What are the experiences that have led me to believe these sorts of things, to think in this sort of way, to be this kind of person? And that's not saying that you have to change that, but just be interested in how you got to be who you are. Love it. Amazing. Kim, I could talk to you all day, but we are going to have to finish. No um, we'll put all the information um, about Kimberly, um, her Twitter, Instagram, website, all of that lot, if, if you want to follow her, if you don't already. And thank you so much for being on the podcast. Thank you for having me. Um, if anyone has enjoyed this and they want to leave us a review, it'd be lovely to know what you thought about it. Or if you feel that we've talked about a topic that you, your friend or your relative um, could really do to hear with, please do share this on your social media and let us know what you think thank you thank you so much for listening to the strong women podcast if you have any feedback on today's topic or your own advice please do let us know on social media or leave us a review on itunes or soundcloud Did you know we also have an online plan that incorporates all the elements I believe create a strong, healthy, happy body? The Model Method Online is an eight-week holistic fitness plan incorporating mental health and nutrition support. Born from a frustration that all online plans are weight loss or aesthetic based, our online plan aims to improve the relationship that you have with your body. Go and try it for free now. The link is in the show notes and stay strong. (laughs) 